Well, welcome back, folks, to another episode of American Genesis, the creation of our American scripture, uh, which is actually the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights. So we've spent the first month talking about the events that led to the uh, writing of the Declaration of Independence and the actual writing of it, what's in it. So today we're going to take another step forward, and we're going to spend quite a bit of time on this one. This is the summer of 87 and the writing of the Constitution, because it's it's much longer, much more involved. Uh, so let's get started by listening to a little music. Tomorrow all the things were lost I'd worked for all my life And I had to start again With just my children and my wife I thank my lucky stars To be living here today Cause the flag still stands for freedom And they can't take that away I'm proud to be an American Where at least I know I'm free And I won't forget the men who died And gave that right to me And I'd gladly stand up next to you And defend her still today Cause there ain't no doubt I love this land God bless the USA Okay, well, little trivia question. In the fall of 1786, an event occurred which directly led to the Constitutional Convention being called in order to amend the Articles of Confederation, which was our government at that point. Which of the following best describes the event that occurred? Was it the Whiskey Rebellion? Was it Georgia engaging in unofficial war with Spain over Florida? Was it Washington calling for a convention to amend the Articles of Confederation? Or was it Shays' Rebellion? Now, every time I do that, I feel like I'm Alex Trebek. Okay, so... Oh. The answer is Shays' Rebellion. Shays' Rebellion, as we will see here in a moment, was an uh, effort by some militiamen, some disgruntled militiamen from the western part of Massachusetts to overthrow the government of Massachusetts. Uh, by the way, this is the event that prompted Thomas Jefferson to say his infamous statement that I hear quoted quite a bit. The tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. Uh, so let's kind of go back and, and kind of review a couple slides that I did before we left a couple of weeks ago. Uh, remember, when Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, he used the term United States of America. And that was one of the first instances that that name had been applied to the new country. Uh, that was you can't find very many records of that happening anywhere prior to the Declaration of Independence. The problem was, even after we had won our freedom from Britain, we were anything but united. I mean, we were desperately disunited, actually. Uh, the economic interests of the three main regions of this new country were completely at odds with each other. New England, which was made up of Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Connecticut, and Rhode Island, was a fishing and a shipping area. And they had their own idea about what needed to be done. The middle states, uh, the big states of New York and Pennsylvania, along with New Jersey and Delaware, uh, were basically uh, a grain producing area, plus a whole lot of new industries and economic uh, you know, in, uh, areas like New York City and Philadelphia, the biggest city. Uh, the South, on the other hand, was a completely agricultural economy for the most part. 
uh, that grew tobacco, rice, indigo. So the result was that these three areas of the United States of America had a patchwork quilt of tax system. Every one of them had their own taxes. There was not a, a United States tax, a, a tax that was uh, levied by all the states against anybody else. They each had their own. Um, so the southern states wanted free trade because they preferred heavily restricted import duties. Uh, and the other, I mean, the others preferred uh, restricted import duties, predict their own economies. On top of that, they all had a different money system. There was no united money system. So the money in Massachusetts was different from the money of South Carolina and Georgia. Political divisions abounded. Uh, there were actually serious discussions talked at this point in time that this country needed to divide up into four different separate nations. An Eastern nation, a Middle nation, a Southern nation, and a Trans-Allegheny nation about all this new land west of the uh, Appalachian Mountains. Uh, foreign affairs. Each state conducted their own foreign affairs. So on one hand, Georgia was at war with Spain. Virginia and Pennsylvania were upset with the closing of New Orleans because that exchange damaged their export trade. The New England states absolutely wanted nothing to do with Britain. And while New York and Pennsylvania wanted reconciliation with Britain, and the southern states wanted to work with France. Folks, it was a mess. It, it really was. It was an actual mess. Look at what some of the people said. Washington, Madison, Monroe, and Jefferson all expressed publicly that they fully expected this new nation to divide into separate regions. They did not think we could last. Uh, one North Carolina statesman, uh, Henry Knox, said the systems are, uh, you know, are the accursed thing. The state systems are the accursed thing that will prevent our being a nation. So it, it really was a disunited states of America in many ways. Uh, so, you know, things were desperate at this point in time. Now, we had a government after the signing of the Treaty of Paris, and after the Revolutionary War, we had a, a government. It was called the Articles of Confederation. They had actually been put in place during the Constitutional Convention, but they really didn't go into effect until after the Revolutionary War was over. Uh, the, uh, you know, the, uh, pardon me, I said Constitutional Convention. I meant the, uh, you know, the uh, Congress that the, uh, was being operated during the time of the Revolutionary War. The new government was primarily designed not to be the British government. In other words, the Articles of Confederation was everything that the British government was not. There was no strong central government. It was called a loose league of friendship. So the Confederation was an alliance. Uh, the states kind of served as a committee uh, it provided for one house legislature with each state having one vote. So Virginia had the same amount of power in the uh, under the Articles of Confederation as did Delaware, a very small state, or Rhode Island. However, the Articles soon proved to be absolutely ineffective because there were so many weaknesses with it. For instance, there was no power to tax. We've talked about that. There was no tax, United States tax. Every state had their own tax. It lacked a strong central executive. There was nobody in charge, folks. I mean, literally, it's like having a committee with no chairman. It did not provide for the conduct of foreign affairs. Every state conducted their own foreign affairs. There was no ability to enforce laws. There, was, there were laws. The, con the Articles of Confederation did pass some laws. The problem was there was nobody to enforce the laws. There was no process for settling disputes between the states. If Georgia got in a uh, upset with South Carolina, its neighbor, there was no way to settle that dispute between these two states. There was not a national judicial system. Each state had a judicial system, but there was no national judicial system. And there was absolutely no way to regulate commerce between the states. So. Uh, on top of that, if you want to change the Articles of Confederation, every state had to agree with it. Can you imagine that happening? Think about it. That 
would you like to get every state in America today to agree on anything? You know, uh, I don't think that would have happened then, and it sure would not happen now. So, folks, there were a lot of people that actually didn't believe this thing was going to last. And I'm not talking about just your pundits. I'm talking about people like Washington and Jefferson and people like this that said, you know, I don't think this thing is going to last because we can't get anything solved. Uh, so we did not get off to a very good start. Well, at that, this government lasted for about seven years, six or seven years uh, operational. But finally, an event occurred, Shays Rebellion, that made it so obvious that if we did not do something to amend the, the Articles of Confederation, that there was going to be just a really bad situation to develop. Fall of 1787, pardon me, 86, a group of disgruntled farmers from western Massachusetts, led by a man by the name of Daniel Shays, who was a Revolutionary War soldier. He had fought at Bunker Hill and fought at Saratoga. Uh, he had fought valiantly, uh, as, long, as well as most of his people that followed him during the Revolutionary War. But they decided that they were so upset with the state government of Massachusetts because the state decided they were going to collect a new tax and uh, on the citizens of Massachusetts. Uh, and relieved, instead of relieving the citizens of debt, which they had incurred a lot of them because of the Revolutionary War, the Confederation had absolutely no power to stop Shays Rebels. So by the spring of 1787, they had really marched up on the, from the western part of Massachusetts. They had gained control of most of the state, clear up to the Springfield Armory. Springfield's about the middle part of Massachusetts. They finally were stopped by a privately financed local commission, a militia. Uh, not a government militia, a bunch of privately financed militia, like a guerrilla uh, mercenary army, in a sense, finally put an end to it and stopped them. Well, if nothing else, folks, Shays' Rebellion made it clear that something had to be done. Washington wrote to uh, Jefferson, he said, without some alteration in our political creed, the superstructure we have been seven years raising at the expense of so much blood and treasure must fall. We are fast verging to anarchy and confusion. Well, he wasn't alone. Fortunately, there were several others that agreed with him. So they decided that they were going to call and hold a new convention of the states to amend the Articles of Confederation. The Constitutional Convention wasn't called, folks, to write a new constitution. It was called to amend the Articles of Confederation. That's not what it ended up doing, but that's what it was supposed to do. So here is... Uh, you know, a marker in Massachusetts, last battle of Shays Rebellion, fought here February 27th, 1787. Well, I probably didn't do a very good job of explaining this. So let's listen to a guy kind of explain it maybe a little bit better than I did. Uh, today we're looking at Shays Rebellion. Hello, welcome to the Daily Bell Ringer. Please don't forget to subscribe and take a look at the questions down in the description. Also, don't forget to check out uh, the description for the worksheet that goes along with this video available at dailybellringer.com. Shays Rebellion is going to be the event that will lead the nation to write a new constitution. But in order to understand what happened with Shays Rebellion, we have to go back and take a look at the Articles of Confederation, which was the first constitution of the United States. Under the Articles, the power was divided between the states and the federal government in what's known as a federal system. Now, ideally, this power would be divided equally, but the Articles gave far more power to the states than the federal government. Remember, the founders had just fought a war to get out from under a monarchy, which is a very centralized government, and, and so they were fearful of giving the federal government too much power. Furthermore, remember the Articles gave the federal government no authority to collect taxes, and that's going to become a major issue, especially when we see what was happening in western Massachusetts in the mid-1780s, and in particular with a guy named Daniel Shays.
Daniel Shays was a veteran of the American Revolution, and he had fought at Bunker Hill and Saratoga. After the revolution was over, he returned to western Massachusetts to start farming. Shays assumed when he left the military that he would get a pension or get paid by the government for his service in the war. Of course, it was the Continental Congress that was supposed to be responsible for maintaining the military and paying these soldiers, but guess what? They can't collect taxes, so they don't have the money to pay the soldiers. So the Continental Congress asked the states to pay these pensions to the soldiers. Well, the state of Massachusetts decides they have to raise taxes in order to raise money to pay these soldiers' pensions, which, again, guess what? Who's going to pay these taxes? The veterans themselves so it's it's a vicious cycle because these farmers in western massachusetts don't have the money to pay the taxes so they don't they go into debt and they try to pay their debt and when they can't pay their debt the courts order that their farms be taken now think about this from the perspective of shays and all these veterans they've just fought a war to get out from under british taxes and now they're being taxed even more severely from the state and their farms are being taken away to say the least they're very upset in reaction to these events, farmers decide to take matters into their own hands, and they begin to attack courthouses or at least surround them and not allow the proceedings to take place. In some cases, judges themselves were being attacked and bullied by large mobs. Daniel Shays emerged as one of the leaders of the mob, and by 1785 into 1786, they decided they needed to continue their protest, but not only that, they believed they needed to arm themselves to prepare to fight. On January 25th, 1786, Daniel Shays along with a mob of close to 1,200 men marched to Springfield, Massachusetts to capture the arsenal there, which is where weapons were stored. But there in Springfield was the Massachusetts Volunteer Militia under the command of a guy named William Shepard with, again, about 1,200 militiamen. Shepard sent out negotiators and instructed the men with Shays to disperse and leave, but they refused. Then Shepard ordered the militia to fire a couple of warning shots over the heads of the protesters, but still they would not leave. So Shepard then ordered the militia to open fire on Shays' men. Two protesters were killed and 20 were injured, but the mob did break up and disperse. Now for a moment, stop and think about what just happened. We have Americans firing on Americans over taxes. One might argue we had a mini civil war almost breaking out here just a few years after gaining independence. But for now, the uprising was over. There were some attempts to rekindle the rebellion, but it just wouldn't gain any support. Daniel Shays was actually uh, arrested, but was pardoned in 1788 and ended up dying in New York in 1825, basically in obscurity. But his rebellion demonstrated how there needed to be a change, that there needed to be a method for collecting taxes for the federal government and a method which the federal government could respond to rebellions and uprisings. So with that, Hopefully you learned something, and thanks for watching. Today we're looking at Shay's Rebellion. Okay, so we have Shay's Rebellion. It's put down, and now the founders, the framers, the people that are involved with our government say, hey, this is we've got to do something. We can no longer exist the way we're existing, because if we don't, uh, this country is going to fall apart. That led to the events of the summer of 1787, the convention that was called to amend the Articles of Confederation. Now, folks, us historians, we like to play this little game amongst ourselves that, you know, where would you like to go back in history and, and look at? And, you know, obviously there are certain events that have occurred in history that almost every one of us would like to see if we could go back in time. I, you know, I would love to go back to see the first person to use fire or riding or or created the wheel. Uh, maybe the, the first person that created, you know, Gutenberg, the printing press. Uh, you know, events like this. Of course, we've been witnessing to some of these major events of world history, like technology, such as, you know, the computer, television, the Internet. These are all events that totally change the world. But one of the events that I would like to go back and really look at would be the summer of 1787. Because, folks, at that point, government as we know it changed forever in much of the world. Up to this point, almost government was almost entirely a monarchy ruled by a few people, you know, or a singular person. 
all of a sudden, after 1787, you begin to see countries develop constitutions that give the power to the people. And today, that is, in the Western world at least, that is the, the primary source of government that we have in this world today. So let's go back and see what happened in the summer of 1887 when a small group of selected officials came together to write what we now call the United States Constitution. Now, just like the Declaration, it's really easy to criticize and condemn the framers of the Constitution. And I hear this constantly, uh, that, you know, I, I just read an article the other day where somebody said the Constitution is outdated, we need to do away with it and create a whole new government because the people that created it were racist, they were homophones, they were uh, all these kind of things. And it's true. They did exclude women. They did exclude racial minorities. They excluded people that lacked property. And looking at this through the 21st century, century constructs, it, it really is indefensible. But you can't do that, folks. You have to go back and look at the events that occurred through the lens of that time. So you got to remember, there was no country in the late 18th century that had realistically dealt with slavery or the slave trade. Women everywhere were denied political power. It wasn't just the United States. Uh, you know, they were just treated like vessels for reproduction. It wasn't just women and slaves. Uh, there were other, the, the Asians, the Irish, the Italians throughout the 19th century were totally discriminated against, you know, and even more re reprehensible is what we did to the Native Americans. I mean, they were regarded almost as subhuman by our government. So, yes, you know, it was a terrible thing. But at the same time, folks, you have to understand that there were great events that came from this summer of 1787 that totally changed the way we view government. And frankly, it's really remarkable that they were able to devise a government that has withstood invasion, or war, civil war, economic catastrophe, social upheaval. And folks, we're still the envy of the whole world. I hear on occasion people saying, you know, well, I'm, you know, I'm gonna leave America. I'm telling you what, there are plenty of people in this world that will take their place. Well, you know, we don't have eight to 10 million people coming across our southern border in the last four years because they hate this country. They are coming here because they know it's better than any other country in the world. So, you know, we've got to keep that in mind. It's, it's easy to condemn the framers for what they didn't do, but we're here to concentrate on what they did do. It's a remarkable document. It's the oldest written constitution still in use today and when you consider the fact that it's only been changed 17 times after the initial Bill of Rights, it's even more remarkable. Um, think about this, folks. When this thing was written, when this Constitution was written, it happened before the Industrial Revolution had really taken off. We were almost totally agrarian. We relied almost totally upon agriculture. Only a few cities, Boston, Philadelphia, New York, uh, Charleston, uh, a few cities like this were big cities in the south. The rest of them were small towns and villages. Uh, it even becomes more remarkable. Just think about it. There's no planes. There's no trains. There's no cars. There's no TV, radio, light bulbs, telephone, internet, computers. It's, it's amazing that these framers were able to write a document that still works in this world today. And I think works terrifically. Other constitutions of Western democracies last about 19 years. That's the average for a constitution in the Western democracy. Ours has lasted 237 years. On top of that, folks, it's a small document. It's very basic. Uh, there's only a little over 4,500 words in our constitution. Look at India's constitution, 146,000 plus words. 
We have seven articles in our constitution. Germany has 170. France has had five different constitutions since 1789. Great Britain doesn't even have one. They rely totally upon parliamentary and judge-made law. Uh, William Gladstone, British prime minister, uh, once said that the United States Constitution was the most wonderful work ever struck off at a given time by the brain and purpose of man. So, you know, a really great document in retrospect. So let's go back and see who these people were that wrote what I think and what a lot of people think is one of the greatest documents ever written in the history of the world. So first thing we need to know is that, you know, when these delegates arrived, uh, they uh, they had to select a leader. Well, obviously, George Washington was going to be that leader. He was he was the man uh, above all else in this country at that time. Um, there's I don't know if there's ever been any other man that was con unanimously considered such a leader of the country, maybe than George Washington was at this time. Now, he was happy to assume this power because, frankly, folks, he abhorred debate. He did not like to get up in front of people and talk about things. On top of that, he pretty well was assured that there was going to be chaos. Uh, and he did not want to be a part of this chaos. Uh, if you read the writings of George Washington, he wasn't really all that happy about coming to the convention. He wanted it to happen. He just didn't really want to be a part of it. He wanted to sit back at his home and, uh, you know, back in Virginia and Mount Vernon and be happy to farm. That's what he wanted to do. He just fought a war for eight years. He didn't want to do this. So who were the delegates? Well, Obviously, they were all white males. There were no minorities. There were no females. Most of them were 40s and 50s. The oldest was Ben Franklin at 81. And frankly, he didn't last much longer after the Constitutional Convention. The youngest was a man by the name of Jonathan Dayton, who was 26 at the time. About half of them were lawyers. Uh, the others were merchants, planners, a couple of physicians. You know, uh, about half of the delegates were slave owners. But several, including Franklin and Alexander Hamilton, who was one of the youngest ones, were vocal opponents of slavery. A lot of the Southern delegates were, you know, uh, defended slavery, particularly John Rutledge and a couple of cousins from South Carolina called the Pinckney Cousins. Uh, they were uh, very much uh, in defense of slavery. Several were really wealthy. Robert Morris of Pennsylvania was the wealthiest. He had an estimated fortune of almost $400 million in today's money. So, you know, they were rich, you know, for the most part. It, well off, at least. Now, this is the key. The people that showed up for the Constitutional Convention, for the most part, was a new generation of leaders. The people that who had led us in the Revolutionary War, and the people who had led in during events prior to the Revolutionary War, for the most part, were not there. The two big exceptions were George Washington and Ben Franklin. Uh, they obviously were very much a part of the Revolutionary War, and they were very much a part of the Constitutional Convention. Uh, some people, you know, didn't particularly care for him. Look at look at what John Adams said. I love this quote. John Adams would later mockingly say of them that Dr. Franklin's electrical rod smoked the earth and outsprung General Washington. Then Franklin electrified him with his rod and thenceforth the two conducted all the policy negotiation, legislation and more. Uh, he's actively making fun of the two. Uh, there was not a lot of love loss between John Adams and George Washington. Uh, if you read back, Adams was his vice president. But there wasn't a great deal of uh, love between the two. They respected each other, but they weren't necessarily really great friends. Many of the delegates represented a new generation of leadership that had that were removed from the Revolutionary War. Uh, 
they saw the Articles of Confederation as weak and ineffective, whereas most of these older leaders wanted a loose League of Friendship, wanted a weak government. So you had people like James Madison and Alexander Hamilton, who were both in their 30s. Uh, and by the way, both of them were protégés of Washington and shared his belief that they needed a strong central government. Um, so they were some of the leaders. Look at who did not attend. This is so telling of uh, the Constitutional Convention. Uh, look who didn't. Patrick Henry. Remember the guy that said, give me liberty or give me death? We we watched a little film of that. He said, I'm not going to go there. I smell a rat. He didn't absolutely did not want any part of amending the Constitution. Uh, Samuel Adams, the man who led the whole Boston Tea Party, who was the Sons of Liberty, said, no way am I involved, going to be involved in this. Thomas Paine, the man who had wrote uh, that pamphlet, you know, that really, you know, gave credence to the whole concept of the Revolutionary War, said he wasn't going to show up. He was asked to show up, and he said, I think you're going to go dilute the state's rights. I think you're going to dilute individual rights. I don't want a strong central government. I'm going to have nothing to do with it. John Hancock. Uh, did not show up. Now, his was primarily because of illness. He was bedridden with the gout. But if you read back what John Hancock said about the early, before the convention actually got going, he wasn't too keen on going. Thomas Jefferson, the man who wrote the Declaration of Independence, happened to be in Paris, and he was glad of it because he really didn't want to be a part of the Constitutional Convention. He, he warmed to it later. But in the beginning, he really didn't want to have anything to do with it. Remember what he said about Shays' Rebellion. He said, the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. It is natural manure. You know, wow. John Adams wanted to be there. John Adams could not be there, though, because he was ambassador to England. And he really did have some later effect upon the Constitution. But he wanted to be there. But, folks, it's so telling about who was not there. Uh, when the convention was over, uh, a lot of people had a lot of things to say about what happened. Jefferson later would call the framers demigods, and uh, de Tocqueville, a man who came here from France in the later uh, early part of the 19th century, said that they were the choicest talents and noblest hearts which had ever appeared in the New World. George Mason, a delegate from Virginia, who wasn't too keen on it uh, after it happened, said the New Englanders were knaves and fools, the Southerners, uh, hang on, the Southerners were coxcombs, you know, that's a term we don't use anymore, and those from the mid-states were more were mere office hunters. So which one was right? Yeah, a little bit of both, okay? Let's be honest, it was a little bit of both uh, that were right. So with that being said, who were the principal players of the Constitutional Convention. Now, all the delegates had a role. Some of them played more important parts than others. When you really analyze the Constitutional Convention, there were seven people that stand out as being the primary uh, focus, the primary players in writing the new Constitution. Obviously, George Washington. Not that he had a lot to do with writing the Constitution, but he kind of presided over it. Uh, he wanted to, to just be kind of a, a, a guiding light. And uh, he didn't have a vision of a stronger union, which was important. And his presence kind of kept the convention from descending in the absolute chaos. He dreaded that. He did not want chaos. And, you know, when George Washington spoke, which was not often in his constitutional convention, people listened. Yeah. Another one was George Mason, man we just mentioned, not given very much uh, credit today, but really played a really integral part in the Constitution. Uh, he was really concerned about the amount of power that some of these new generation of leaders were wanting to give a new federal government. Uh, he was also concerned about the unwillingness on the part of the conventioners to in the slave trade, which, again, kind of ironic because he was a slave owner. But 
he knew that the slave trade needed to end. In the end, he was only one of three delegates not to sign the Constitution. But he played a very important part because he is the man that championed a Bill of Rights, which was not originally included in the Constitution. And that's the reason he didn't sign it. And he said, without a Bill of Rights, a Constitution means nothing. And eventually, he won. You know, another man that really played a really big part in the Constitution Convention was a man by the name of Roger Sherman, a delegate from Connecticut. He's the man that proposed what became known as the Great Compromise, which proposed that each state would be proportionally represented in the House of Representatives and the states would have an equal number of senators. This we're going to get into this, but that was that was the compromise that actually saved the Constitutional Convention because it was ready to split up over how the how the uh, <clears throat> representatives were going to be proportioned. It it actually saved the convention. You know, there were four other guys. Pardon me while I get a drink. William Patterson of New Jersey. He was the principal author of something that became known as the New Jersey Plan, which attempted to safeguard the rights <clears throat> of the small states. Being from a small state, he was very scared that the large states would come to dominate the convention and the government. And uh, <clears throat> he said, unless we come up with some kind of way to safeguard the efforts of the small states, this isn't going to work. James Wilson of Pennsylvania is another one that had a really big part in his constitutional convention. He was the most vocal proponent of a strong central government as opposed to William Patterson and George Mason. He proposed to have a single executive, not a committee, run the executive branch. Uh, he also favored the direct election of a president. And he said this president ought to have absolute powers over legislation. He ought to be able to veto everything. Uh, now, he didn't get his way either, but it's really important that he did these things because he, in a sense, uh, his ideas led to the concept of the single executive, the president, with limited veto powers. He also was the one that kind of helped propose the electoral college, uh, which is how we elect our president, and we'll get into that later. He's also remembered as the delegate who brokered the infamous three-fifths compromise, which, uh, again, probably saved the Constitutional Convention, but left a really bad taste in the mouth of a lot of people, because that's the clause that basically said uh, states can count their slaves as three-fifths of a person. We'll get into that later, too. Finally, there was Benjamin Franklin. Benjamin Franklin was the oldest and in many ways, the most respected delegate at the convention, uh, other than Washington. People adored Benjamin Franklin. Uh, but Franklin was really ill, and he really never participated a lot in the debates. In fact, he was absent from the, Constitution, from the convention on several days. But he had such a calming presence. And when he spoke and when he was there, people would would give him his due. He was a pragmatist. He said, you know, hey, we, we've got to come up with ways that we can all come together. And of course, remember, he's the one that supposedly said at the end of writing, uh, signing the Declaration of Independence, we don't hang together, we'll surely hang separately. Well, he was almost in that way with the Constitutional Convention. He said, we've got to hang together. But folks, the real genius of the Constitutional Convention was a really young, soft-spoken, bookish planter from Virginia, who a lot of people really weren't very aware of, a man by the name of James Madison. He would end up having the biggest influence on the writing of the Constitution and would gain the nickname of the father of the Constitution. So let's real quickly look at James Madison. He was born in 1751. Uh, born of a wealthy family, uh, grew up on a 5,000-acre tobacco plantation, Montpelier, had over 100 slaves working in the cotton uh, tobacco fields. Uh, 
he had a very uh, typical education for a wealthy man. He had tutors in his early age. And then at the age of 16, he went off to what is now Princeton, New Jersey, or Princeton University in New Jersey. Kind of unusual. Most of the Virginia planter's sons went to William and Mary. He chose to go to Princeton. I'm not exactly for sure why. Um, I've, I've read it, but I forgot now why he went to Princeton instead. It was there that he really fell in love with the political philosophies of the Enlightened. And he studied the writings of some of the great Enlightened philosophers, Thomas Hobbes, Montesquieu, Rousseau, and particularly John Locke. Remember, we mentioned some of these names when we talked about the Declaration of Independence. And we're going to hear more about them uh, in coming days. After graduation, he came back to Virginia, young man, studied the law, but never took the bar. So he was technically a lawyer, but he was not, uh, he couldn't really practice law. When the Revolutionary War broke out, he really was not a soldier. He never participated in battle, but he did uh, become a member of the Virginia House of Delegates. And it was there that he became a close ally of the governor of Virginia, who at the time was Thomas Jefferson. So Madison was kind of a young protege of Thomas Jefferson. Uh, he also served in the Confederation Congress after the war and during this period of time when we were governed by the Articles of Confederation. And he, then when the new constitution was eventually uh, put in, ratified and our new government came into effect, he was a congressman for several years. Uh, from the state of Virginia. Uh, it was here that he became a close ally of both Washington and Jefferson uh, because he worked, you know, with both those guys to kind of, uh, you know, get their due in Congress. Adams and Hamilton uh, kind of disagreed with him on a lot of things. He and Hamilton, ironically, worked together on the Federalist Papers. But they had some ideas that didn't gel too much with Madison, and particularly Jefferson. When Jefferson was elected president in 1800, Madison was given the position of secretary of state. In other words, he was in charge of foreign policy, which is really kind of ironic because he, he really didn't have any experience in foreign policy. Uh, a lot of people think that it was on the job training uh, from Jefferson because Within a few, couple of years, it became really clear that Madison was the heir apparent to Jefferson. Everybody pretty much agreed that when this is all over, when Jefferson left the presidency, that Madison would be the next president. And indeed, he was. He easily defeated his opponent, Charles Pinckney, in the election of 1808. Uh, unfortunately for Madison, he didn't have a very good administration as president because he had to fight the War of 1812. And uh, that was a, a tough situation. He did preside over what became known as the era of good feelings, which was actually something that is given credit mostly to James Monroe, his successor. But uh, Madison had a pretty rough eight years as president, I'll be honest. Uh, he also saw the demise of the old Federalist Party. After leaving the presidency in 1816, 18, Madison retired to Montpelier, and he lived his life from that point on uh, just doing what he wanted to do, which was read books. He reviewed his letters. He had kept an intense diary during the Constitutional Convention. And, uh, you know, he edited that. And thank heavens he did, because we know a lot about the Constitutional Convention from his diary, because otherwise we wouldn't know what all happened. Um, by the way, Madison was married to Dolly Payne. And she became known as the first lady, really the first three presidential wives, Martha Washington, Abigail Adams, and of course Jefferson was a widower at that point, uh, did not really have a, a lady that really worked in the White House with them. Dolly Madison was the one who kind of started the title of first lady, and she was a political force in her own right. She was a very uh, important person, and she really helped create this atmosphere of bipartisan cooperation that led to this era of good feelings. And, uh, you know, she she was really a key partner with James Madison in running the country. Uh, she didn't run it, obviously, 
but she had a lot of influence upon Madison and what he did. So, Madison dies at the age of 85, but what, why is he called the father of the Constitution? That's where we're going to take up next week. We're going to look at why he was called the father of the Constitution, and we're going to look at some of the big questions that had to be addressed at the Constitutional Commission. You know, exactly what caused him to uh, to do all this. So, I hope I've kind of helped you remember some of this from your old high school days, which if you're like me, that was a long time ago, right? <laughs> so I've enjoyed this. I've had a good time and we will hopefully see you next week. We were about.